the Bible doesn't say God so loved America. It says God so loved the world. So we're to, our love is to be borderless and to uh, be big. And um, so, you know, America first is not just a political statement, but I think it's a theological heresy uh, to say America first because Jesus is the, the last shall be first, the, that we're to seek first the kingdom of God. And that's a, a very different kind of way of thinking to the world. Shane Claiborne calls America first a theological heresy, but America first is not something Trump came up with. It is a historic phrase that was used during the time of World War I by President Woodrow Wilson, who favored an isolationist policy prior to 1917, and was later used by Warren Harding when he ran for president in 1920. However, its most well-known usage was during the late 1930s as tensions rose in Europe with the military invasions of Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia. This culminated in the formation of the America First Committee in 1940. Historian Susan Dunn wrote that this group was made up of a diverse cast of isolationists and anti-interventionists came in all stripes and colors, ideological, economic, ethnic, geographical. Making up this eclectic coalition were farmers, union leaders, wealthy industrialists, college students, newspaper publishers, wealthy patricians, and newly arrived immigrants. There were Democrats, Republicans, Socialists, Communists, Anti-Communists, Radicals, Pacifists, and simple FDR haters. What this group said was don't get involved in Europe's wars, we have enough problems at home without getting into other people's problems. Such a sentiment was not new as you could see it in the newspapers that criticized President McKinley's war with the Spanish Empire in 1898. The sentiment was that America has problems of its own to deal with. In the case of President McKinley, it was lynchings and violence in the South. By the time of President Franklin Roosevelt, it was the Great Depression. The America First Committee was made up of many people of different backgrounds, ideologies, occupations, and religions, but it was the old right that became the dominant force in the movement. The old right was the more libertarian-leaning side of the Republican Party that wanted to get back to the founders' beliefs that America should not be involved in entangling alliances and believed that people's freedoms diminish and shrink during times of war. Given that America was in a massive depression, more government spending, an increase in taxes, and men dying overseas, leaving widows and orphans at home, it was not a desirable outcome. This was initially well received by the public, but with the fall of France to the Nazis, its influence began to decline. Journalist Garrett Garrett wrote in the Chicago Tribune that if you say, I am first of all an American, you have to be careful, it may be misunderstood, you might have said, I am for America first, and the American who says that will be denounced in his own country and by his own government. Because of this, some accused them of being fascist for not wanting to go to war, an irony I hope that is not lost on anyone that someone is called a fascist for not wanting war. Justin Reomondo, editorial director of Antiwar.com, stated in his book Reclaiming the American Right that this America first old right was a different kind of nationalism compared to European nationalism. Reomondo states it is a calculated risk to describe the old right as nationalist, but one that must nevertheless be taken. The risk is that the reader will think in terms of the Prussian model, statist, militaristic, obscurantist. This would be a gross error. The truth is that the old right represented a distinctly American phenomenon, which owed nothing to the old world and was, in all essential ways, the exact opposite of its European counterpart. It was nationalism of an unprecedented kind, based not on blood and soil and the need to expand, but on a tendency towards introversion, an impulse to draw back from the world and its endless quarrels. Journalist John Flynn, and leader of the America First Committee, declared almost a year before America's entry into the war that the war in Europe was not a war for democracy, as some had been saying, but a war between empires for imperialism. Why, he asked, should America sacrifice its democracy for European empires who did not care for their or other citizens, but only for their profits and colonies? Flynn feared that America's intervention in Europe would only lead to an increase in the size of government, which would ultimately lead to America becoming a fascist state. To Flynn, this outcome must be avoided at all costs. 
Ironically, for their opposition to intervention in the European war, they were called fascists themselves. Within ten years, these same men would then be lambasted by the same people for opposing the Korean War and lending millions of dollars to anti-communist groups in Greece and Turkey. To be accused of being fascists and also wanting the communists to take over the world is quite an accomplishment for a movement. Despite this, the America First Old Right was on the brink of victory as its main leader, Robert Taft, looked like he would win the 1952 Republican primaries. Despite winning the most votes of any candidate, Taft was robbed of the nomination and instead, Dwight Eisenhower was named nominee. This marked a great shift of power in the Republican Party from the non-interventionists to the hyper-interventionists, which are usually referred to as the neoconservatives, who controlled the party long after the fall of the Berlin Wall. There is a little bit of irony in how the creators of postcards from Babylon criticize conservatives of being militaristic and imperialistic, not an unfounded or unfair criticism, but they fail to discuss the change in foreign policy under Trump's administration and the increased number of conservatives who spoke out against America's ongoing wars and attempts at nation building. While the America First movement of the mid-1900s doesn't perfectly translate over into its current usage, it does bear similarities such as a focus on not getting into entangling alliances that might compromise America's sovereignty or willingness to criticize America's previous wars and attempts at nation-building or getting into new wars or prolonging current wars. The current movement does differ from its predecessor in that it has no issue with spending more taxpayer dollars on infrastructure or increasing tariffs on imports. But it does show a drastic shift against the old prevailing neoconservative view and foreign policy which the documentary then criticizes in its last chapter, yet this detail goes unnoticed. America First has been called everything from being fascist to be a communist enabler, and now the label of theological heresy is added to the list. The question is, is there no label that can't be placed on the belief of anti-imperialism?